I think there's broad general agreement that small businesses in this country will not be able to survive unless there's extraordinary assistance. And so the, the idea behind the proposal that we are finalizing now is the idea of how can we transfer money as quickly as possible to help small businesses meet payroll and operating obligations for a period of time roughly equivalent to six weeks. And the idea is to, to basically use small community bank, bankers and the banking industry in general, the, those who are approved to do that kind of uh, activity now through the 7A program that's pre-existing and any other financial institutions who the Treasury Department allows to, and approves to participate that would basically allow a small business to go and get uh, money in the amount equivalent to what their payroll and operating costs are for a period of time of roughly about six weeks. Uh, that those final details are being worked out. But the goal is to keep employees connected to their employers so that people aren't just having to stay home but aren't and not just feeling the stress of being laid off, but the uncertainty of whether they even have a job to go back to when this is finished. And added to that component is the small businesses who will tell you that many of them, if you force them to get rid of their employees, by the time they're ready to restart whenever that is, they may not be able to. Uh, depending on the industry they're in, it's hard to go out, find someone, hire them, train them, and get up and running. That could be another couple of weeks or more that most of these uh, small businesses cannot afford. So we feel very good about the progress, what we made. We think we really, I mean, we don't have a document to hand you yet because there's some fine details that have to be worked out, but we're very confident that we're going to have a proposal uh, in time that we hope can gain wide bipartisan approval. And um, Senator Collins has been instrumental in all this, so I want, we want to hear from her as well. Thank you very much. Senator Rubio and I have been working with our colleagues and with the Secretary of the Treasury to devise a plan that would help our small businesses survive this crisis and ensure that the people that they employ continue to get paychecks. Every day I am hearing from small businesses in my state that are on the verge of going under. The hospitality industry in particular, the restaurants, the B&Bs, the gift shops, the small hotels are being adversely affected by the, the virus, not because their employees are afflicted with it, but because their business has totally dried up. One hotel in Maine lost over 84 reservations in one day's time due to the cancellation of classes by a local college. We want to make sure that businesses that otherwise would be thriving and doing well make it through this pandemic that we are enduring. We want to make sure that their employees make it through this pandemic. And when this crisis is over, we want those employees to be able to come back to work at those small businesses. If we do not act to help the small business sector, I predict that we will see massive layoffs and inordinate number of small businesses shuttering their doors. They simply won't be able to survive. So as Senator Rubio said, what our plan would do is provide a federally guaranteed loan to a small business to help that business maintain payroll for its employees and other customary expenses such as utilities. At the end of the period of time, probably around six or eight weeks, the loan could be forgiven if it has been used to sustain those workers. Now, we put in restrictions so that the loan can't be used to give pay raises to the owners, for example, or to increase profits, or to uh, boost 
the benefits for shareholders. Most of these small businesses, of course, uh, don't have shareholders. It is intended to ensure that employees can make it through this period, that the small business can make it through this period, and that when this crisis passes, they can reunite. And we will still have vibrant Main Street businesses employing millions of Americans. And that's the concept that we're working hard on. I want to make sure we're characterizing this correctly. You're looking at loans that could later be grants if they meet, if businesses meet certain requirements. And how do you define the small businesses that you're looking for in law? Look, can I handle the, the second one first? Um, th there's already an existing definition of small business under the SBA regulations. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'll ask Susan to add to this component, but it's not loans that could be. They, they will be become grants if you used it for payroll and customary business. If you used it for some other purpose, then it will transition into the equivalent of what's now an called an impact loan. But listen, the overwhelming majority of the people that are going to seek these out are going to use it for purposes of paying their employees and keeping you know, their, their rent or their lease or their mortgage up to date so they don't get evicted. Because if we don't prevent that, then it's going to spread into the real estate market as well. But yes, every penny that they that they borrow and use for purposes of keeping people employed, they won't will not they will not have to pay back. And anticipating your next question, um, the estimate from the Treasury is that this would be about a three hundred billion dollar program. about the second stimulus package that is about to pass because of the weight it places on small businesses. Does what you're proposing fix that issue as well? We believe that what we've proposed will really be of extremely benefit, of extreme benefit to our small businesses. Um, some of the family leave provisions that are in the bill that we've just approved, and I voted for it, um, are difficult to administer. And for reasons that I don't understand, they do not apply to very large businesses, those over 500 employees. So I think that our proposal will be very effective in ensuring that jobs are there for employees once this crisis ends, and that's the purpose of it. We recognize the importance of, of family leave and, and medical leave to take care of those who are exposed uh, to the coronavirus or who are caring for someone who's exposed to it, but there are going to be far more people who are affected by those this crisis economically uh, than those who are affected from a health perspective. We're concerned about both groups. Let me make that very clear. Yeah, I mean, so if, again, if you're using it for payroll, so so, give me, so a real world example, someone, um, obviously there, this requirement now goes into law when it's signed, so there might be a gap in time, but either way, if you use, if you, let's say you have 10 employees and you can't operate or, or they're quarantined, and you use the money from the loan to pay their salaries for that period of time, it, it becomes, for, you forget, it's forgiven. So uh, the, the answer is yes, uh, that, they, that they will have access to funds that will allow them to keep their payroll for around, we estimate a period of about six weeks, um, whether or not they avail themselves of the potential you know, tax uh, system advance that the other system contemplates. And, and if that's the case, then they could, you know, that's why the theory is that if they're using the tax benefit for some portion of it, it could actually extend their ability to keep their employees on payroll. Obviously, that'll depend on the business. Paul? Uh, forgive me if you address this, My My social distancing was being late. Um, how do you determine when this is over, and uh, either for this program or the other programs, like what, what is the tripwire for knowing we're out of the crisis? 
First of all, the program would be retroactive to March 1st. And right now, we're looking at a June 30th end. But obviously, um, if, in fact, the crisis hasn't passed by then, it could conceivably be extended. But those are the parameters that we're looking at right now. And, and the, but it'll give us a baseline. Now we know what we're dealing with, because now we know how many businesses there are. We, we have a baseline to build on. That just becomes a function of extending it and providing the money for it. Um, as far as your question of when we know the crisis is over, I mean, that, that we're uncharted territory. We've never shut down our economy uh, for public health rationale the way we're doing right now. So if you talk to epidemiologists, they would tell you we're watching China because they're going to restart their economy and it could lead to a second bump of infections, which could lead to further shutdowns. The answer is this is we know this will be in place and provides certainty for a six to eight week period for some employer. And, you know, we'll have to address the future uh, down the road. But right now we're just trying to get as much help as possible out there to not get people laid off and not get and not get small businesses closing. Yes, ma'am. So, Mary, I wanted to ask you about something that's happening in your home state. I'm sure you'd want to respond to. There's been some pretty um, drastic images of people gathered on the beaches of Florida. Is it appropriate that those beaches remain open? Well, they've been closed in terms of uh, uh, after a certain time, and local authorities have each pursued it differently. Unfortunately, this coincided with spring break, which made it more complicated. I think the hardest thing we're dealing with here is we are a highly individualistic society. And we're trying to convince Americans that we have to do something that may not be of direct benefit to you, but is of direct benefit to everyone. And, um, and obviously, that's always a challenge. And, and, and for the overwhelming majority of Americans, I mean, if you, all you have to do is step out in the street anywhere, and you'll see that people are understanding that. But you're always going to have people that don't think it's going to you know, impact them. You're 25 years old. You're healthy. People like me don't get hurt by this. Well, number one, we don't know that. Um, we're seeing a spike in cases among young people in France and in Germany that's concerning. But, and we, because this thing's been around 15 weeks. So to predict how it's going to behave as it moves forward is, is a risky proposition. But the other is, that's not the point. The point is, right now, the reinfection rate is about two and a half, 2.5. So for every person that gets infected, they're theoretically infecting two and a half to three more people. If you infect enough people, we know that a percentage of them are going to show up at emergency rooms in need of ventilation and ICU beds. If, we do, if this moves too fast, we're going to overwhelm the healthcare system. And then no one's going to be able to access them. If you have a heart attack, if you have a car, God forbid, a car accident, you will, you, we, will be, we will break the system because we will overwhelm it. That is the danger they confronted in China. That's the danger they're confronting in parts of Italy now. And that's the danger we're trying to avoid. And the only way to avoid it is to keep people from being in close contact with other people so we can slow down the infection rate or as they say flatten the curve so explaining that to people ain't easy you know but I know everyone's trying and uh, forgive me if you've answered this I also can um, you have safeguards in place I, I'm assuming so that you know businesses that are, are able to keep operating do not use this to effectively subsidize their payroll is that and how would you do that if that's the case? Well, and that's one of the items we're working through. There's a desire to build a safeguard like that in. So obviously, how do we craft it so that, I think, to use an example, you know, someone's payroll is 50000 for two months, but they made 150000 which is even more than what they made last year, because they happen to be in some particular industry that benefits. Mass manufacturing. Right. Want to that. And, yeah. And so... Um, so that, that trying to build in language that allows Treasury or the administrators of this to, to be able to not allow this to be used for that purpose is a universal desire. Um, we have to, have to graph, draft language, and that's one of the final, that's one of the pieces that we're working through. How do we define that? But that's certainly not the intent. When do you, when do you see this coming together time-wise over the next <laughs> So I'm going to give the optimistic response to that. We could use some optimism right now. Uh, obviously, we've completed action now on the House Pass bill. This is a third bill. There are three separate task forces that are contributing to it, including our task force, which Senator Rubio is, is heading. And we hope to get language uh, together 
tomorrow morning um, and start sharing it more widely and vetting it. We're t talking to uh, people on both sides of the aisle. There's no reason why this should be uh, a partisan exercise. And in fact, I would say if we cannot come together in a bipartisan way to form a response to such a serious threat to our public health and our economy, then shame on us. And I believe that we can come together. So I anticipate optimistically um, that we will stay here until this work is done on the third bill. And my hope is that we will pass it sometime this weekend. Yeah, we're not we're not leaving until we do. That's the first answer. The second is, we don't have weeks. I don't know if we even have many days to act on this. People are making decisions at this very moment about what to do with their employees before after they pay them tomorrow. So we need to move on this very quickly. I would also say that at least on this portfolio, when it comes to small business, we're blessed to have as a counterpart uh, ranking member Cardin, who is one of the uh, easiest and most cooperative people to work with, a very professional, understands this very well. And many of these proposals build on the core of a proposal that we had already been working with him and Chairwoman Velasquez on, and we're hoping to make part of the first package. The, the biggest difference between this one and a week ago is that one was $50 billion. Uh, to, just to show you the, how fast this has moved and the magnitude of it. No, time for one more, yes. Because we have to go write a bill. Are you talking to Senator Cardin now, though, at, like right now, as you're doing I just talked to him right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did. And, and with the staff, and um, obviously we got to get our house in order on our end, you know. I, I'm, but the general concept here of allowing the federal government to step forward and, and get cash into the hands of small businesses as defined by statute and rule quickly so they can keep people on payroll is an idea that we had what they call four corners agreement, the ranking member and the chairwoman in the House, the ranking member and myself in the Senate. The, as I said, the biggest difference now is just the magnitude of it. And in some ways, I guess it's, we would probably be revisiting this anyway, given how fast the mo events have moved in the last seven days. So, but um, but we're building on what we had already discussed, and and um, and I, I think we can make, at least on this portion of this, I'm optimistic we can make a lot of progress um, because of that. Let me just add one data point that underscores the urgency for acting on our portion of this new package. In the state of Maine, in the last three days, there were more claims for unemployment compensation than in all of March of last year. Three days. And that shows that businesses are already feeling the cash flow problems, seeing declining revenues, losing customers, and being forced to lay off their employees. That's why we feel so strongly that we must act, and we must act immediately. Thank you. Thank you.